Hi everybody, welcome back to The Health Bridge. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Pedro, how's it going? Fantastic, I am happy to be here. You know I love doing The Health Bridge. And uh, we have one of our favorite guests uh, back on the show today, uh, back by popular demand, and uh, we're just, we love hanging out with them. Tom Maltair, who has been teaching everywhere, including uh, Bastyr University and the Autism Research Institute, uh, IFM, uh, he uh, basically wrote the book on whole life nutrition and he has a new book coming out. And so we're just, we're super excited to hang with you. Tom, welcome back to the Health Bridge. Hey, Pedro. Hey, Sarah. Good to see you again. This is great. We're excited. This is, uh, this is a lot of fun for us because, you know, there's a lot of people out there uh, trying to do the health thing and um, I'd say most of them call Tom for advice. <laughs> so Tom, Tom's the guy that sits there and reads all the studies. Uh, you have been pushing the envelope and really, you know, when, when I run into uh, a question about something, I call Tom. He just sent me something uh, uh, two days ago, by the way. See, I do sometimes read email. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so he's, you know, a plethora of information there. And so your next book called The Elimination Diet is huge. I know you've been practicing working with people on elimination diets for some time, and you've modified it a little bit just based on uh, boots on the ground type of uh, results that you had. So what's up? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is results-based. This is the whole reason why I do anything in life is really I want people to feel better. And if it didn't work, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> but after you see thousands of people change their lives entirely, they let go of their autoimmune conditions, they let go of their irritable bowel, they let go of their headaches, their skin problems, their back pain, whatever it is they're suffering from that has to do with inflammation, it's a good idea to calm down that inflammation. And so many people are like, you know, well, so many people are diseased, right? And they're like, I don't know why I'm diseased. I should take more medications. I should do something. And I'm like, wait a second. Where does disease come from? Disease comes from a simple imbalance. Basically, you're getting too much of things you don't need and not enough of things that you do need. So I like to call it the irritant versus nutrient balance. So if you have too many irritants, not enough nutrients, boom, you slide down into disease. So it's, it's that simple. And if you start looking at life, you start thinking, what are the potential things that my body can perceive as irritants? You say, well, who would perceive them as irritants? It would be your immune cells, your microbial interaction cells that primarily line your gastrointestinal tract. They would seek out and feel what's happening in the environment and determine, is this friend or is this foe? Well, what's happening in the intestinal tract? You know, the intestinal tract constantly is coming in, in contact with microbes, of course, but it's also coming in contact with food. And food, more than anything else, will shift microbial content. Food, more than anything else, is going to provide nutrient content. So if you really want to shift the balance and increase nutrients, decrease irritants, you have to shift your food. So really, come on, man. I was at Bastard University learning from Alan Gaby and Joe Pizzorno and the old school dudes, and they're all saying the same thing. You know, they're saying, hey, if you've got a person with gallbladder disease, look at this research paper showing that 100% of people with gallbladder disease get better on elimination diet. If you've got rheumatoid arthritis, look at this particular study showed 90% of people on rheumatoid arthritis get better on elimination diet. Hey, if you have ADD, ADHD, mood disorders and whatnot, 70%. If you've got migraines, 85%. You know, so the, the list just kept going on. I mean, they're like, why wouldn't you intervene first? with an elimination diet. And really, that's what they teach at Functional Medicine, right? It's the first R of the 4R program. Remove the irritants. What's the most common irritant? It's your food. So all this is is basically an examination. It's a, it's a laboratory experiment on yourself. All you're doing is you're seeing what happens when you add in a bunch of really nutrient-dense, anti-inflammatory food, and you let go of everything else for a while. Does your body heal? And I would say 80 plus percent of the time, it heals so significantly, people are shocked. And they say, oh my gosh, I had no idea I could live life at this level. And that's what I'm about. You guys know that. I want to lift people up to the next level. So. <laughs> Tom, I, I, Tom, I so love this. And I, you know, one of the things we do on the Health Bridge is we talk about East meets West meets best. And I, I yeah. love how you just described this irritant versus nutrient balance because that's something I never heard in my conventional medical training. So I just, I just want to highlight how important this is. And then even if we, you know, kind of find that middle ground between East meets West, which is where I think functional medicine hangs out. Right. There's still some issues, some ways in which 
the Institute for Functional Medicine maybe doesn't exactly provide what we need with this elimination diet or irritant versus nutrients. Can you speak to that? Well, sure. You know, the Institute for Functional Medicine is constantly changing. So I have to give credence to that fact. And every time I talk to them, it sounds like they're changing their elimination diet. So kudos to them. They're evolving with the science. So that's fantastic. One of the things that they've honored, which I also honor, is the fact that a lot of people, when they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, whatnot, the upper intestinal tract can't break down some of the starches, some of the sugars. So maybe there's an enzyme on the brush border like the disaccharidase. It's not breaking down the, the sugars very well into single uh, sugars. So then we have an issue then with gas, nausea, bloating, feeding those bacterium. So it's something called FODMAPs, the fermentable sugars, the uh, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polylols. So these particular substances are feeding organisms instead of feeding the humans, right? And then we have problems. So we address the FODMAP issue. And then we also mentioned, you know, gosh, if you're not finding benefit on this over an extended period of time, you may want to look at starch digestion as well. So we're taking out the grains and legumes and whatnot. So yeah, we have a secret weapon, really, during this entire process. And that's my wife, Allie. Uh, you know, you've seen our cookbooks. You know what she's capable of. She's fabulous at adapting any recipe to be whatever free you need except for taste free. They're always delicious and they're always amazing. So uh, yeah, you don't have to suffer. You can go through this process and enjoy yourself. That's a that's a big point. Um, and there's, there's a couple layers to this. And this is something that um, I, I want to highlight because a lot of patients have been trained uh, by the traditional medical system now to come in and say, okay, well, I don't feel well, so why don't we run $15,000 worth of labs on me and, you know, poke and prod and, you know, kick me in the ribs and, and you know, I'll see 23 specialists and one of you guys is going to hopefully tell me the answer. And one of the things that I love about the elimination diet and how it works, and again, it's, look, I, I don't want to poo-poo tests. Tests are awesome. They're just expensive and not always necessary when you can start doing some of your own relevant stuff is, you know, in three weeks or whatever your protocol is, in three weeks, you can have such a profound sense of what your body is doing well with and not doing well with that it's just cheap, frontline, effective medicine that then can help kind of illuminate what tests you need instead of spending all your money on the front end and still feeling like crap. Two things, two things, you're dead on. Number one, 2007, when I was getting my AFMCP training from the Institute for Functional Medicine, I had this young faculty member jump up. His name was Dr. Mark Hyman. <laughs> and he said to the room, he, this is what his words were. I remember them. I wrote them down in my notes. He said, if you don't have a nutritionist in your practice, you're not practicing medicine. He said, I put every one of my patients through an elimination diet through my nutritionist first. And then their symptoms clear enough. All the fog from all the extraneous inflammatory responses that are happening is, is happening in them clears up enough that I can see, I can pinpoint where we need to intervene. Mm. Right? So that mm. makes sense. It makes too much sense to ignore. Let me give you a case study of my own. I had this gal come in. She has sleep apnea. She has asthma. She's got chronic fatigue so bad she can't even stare me in the eyes during the session. You know, she's like looking down at the floor and I have to speak up and then she looks up at me a little bit and then her head kind of goes down. I mean, she's just drained, right? A shell how, of How young is she, Tom? How young? She's in her 50s. So, uh, you know, this particular person had been seeing six specialists, right? She's on a laundry list of medications. She has a ton of diagnosis, including irritable bowel, including atypical bipolar disorder. You know, I call her the kitchen sink kind of client, right? And she's going nowhere but down. She's losing energy. She's losing vitality. She's just gone. She's not even present, right? And uh, the neurologist sends her in to say, hey, you know, maybe you should put her on a ketogenic diet. And I'm looking at all the symptoms and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's having food reactions. Oh my gosh, she's having food reactions. Like, mm -hmm. let's get the foods out and let's see what happens. So we put her on elimination diet, right? She's doing all this stuff for years, 10 years of disability, no changes. She's just going down, 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 down. 12 days. Within 12 days, she wakes up. Like literally, she goes from being five hours of functionality in a day to being a 15 hour a day, type A personality, just like go, 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 super peppy. You know, you see her now and she's like, hey, waving to you as I pass. I mean, she actually lives down the street from me. So it's like, you know, wow. Medications, 10 years of intervention, six specialists, what does she get? 12 days on the elimination diet, what does she get? She says she has a new lease on life. 
like she was really checking out. She was thinking her future meant like a, you know, a walker or a wheelchair or something. She was just going down, 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 down. And now, boop, really, it's, it's a simple intervention. I mean, what is two weeks of your life? What is four weeks of your life, life it's, if it's going to mean a new life, right? What if you could take it to the next level? Tom, I want to back up for a minute because I, I really like the story. And it's interesting to me that her neurologist referred her to you for a ketogenic diet. Can you unpack that a little bit and then tell us about maybe how you managed her carbohydrates when you put her on the elimination diet? Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, he was concerned because of a, a past history with father having seizures, but she had no history with seizures at all. So he was just kind of grasping. And we had a phone conversation. And I said, you know, here's what I'm seeing. She has also had, uh, you know, bone issues and all sorts of different malabsorptive problems. And so I was looking at the, the GI issues and I said, wow, you know, this, this really kind of screams of a gluten sensitivity, dairy sensitivity, maybe FODMAP issue, you know, going on. And so sure enough, you know, we pull out the food sensitive stuff and she got better on most everything except for a little bit of the bowel discomfort. So it turns out that she had polyol issues with the avocados. It turns out she couldn't tolerate apples and pears. So we had to work with starch uh, or in this particular case, sugar uh, maldigestion, right? So yeah, it was, it was a kind of a fine tuning that had to take place to calm the gut down. And then we're always focusing on whole foods. So we're never saying, you know what, stop eating what you're eating now and replace it with a refined version of it. That's just not how this works. And really how food sensitivities work, you guys know this, a little bit goes a long way. So if someone is 99% in on an elimination diet, they're not in. They have to be 100% in. You have to be committed to taking out all of the potential exposures to foods in order for your immune cells to calm down. We know this, right? If you're going to be exposed to a virus, someone can cough, you know, and you'll go, oh, no, I'm going to get that. You can get a tiny fragment and be exposed and it activates your entire immune system. Mm -hmm. It's the same way of foods. Mm -hmm. If you go eat out someplace and you get glutened because you're putting food in a fryer that just had some wheat tortilla in it, right? You're, you're, you're done. You're going to have some sort of reaction. So Alessio Fasano, right? He works at the Autism Research Institute Scientific Roundtable. He said to me in an interview when we were hanging out, he said, 99% e effort equals zero results. So I say 100% effort equals 100% results. You're in or you're out. You do it, right? So we teach people how to eat at home. We teach people how to make food in their, their kitchens. We have cooking instruction videos as part of a program support. We've got recipes upon recipes upon recipes. You know our recipe blog and Ali did the cookbooks. So yeah, we really try and make people self-sufficient, try and teach them how they can be their own best advocate for their health. Yeah, I want to unpack that a little bit more because you're creating an opportunity for people to enjoy life. Um, I think a lot of the pushback that we've all heard is, you know, oh, they're gonna take everything away from me. And you know, it's like this absolutely, you know, restrictive lifestyle where, you know, you're, you're eating rice cakes and, and hating life. And it's this, this weird uh, mentality that comes with people thinking, you know, what, what, what are they gonna subject me to? Where, <laughs> you know, they're like this patient of yours who's nodding off and for 10 years, they don't have enough energy to like do anything in life, but they're not willing to let go of the things that are poisoning them. So what is life like on the other side of that? I mean, I know Ali's, I mean, you guys have wonderful recipes and it's been wonderful. Um, when you have patients let go of that 1%, and actually do what it takes to get it done. How quickly, I mean, obviously, you know, in some cases it's, it's days. How Three quickly do you see days. results? Yeah, and then um, at what point, I mean, can they ever go back? I mean, these are questions I hear all the time to certain foods, and at what point do they have to kind of maintain these diets? Great questions. Oh my gosh, so pertinent, because everybody wants to know that, right? That's, that's great, Pedro. So the reality is, this is a tool for you. This is an experiment. This is you playing. This is you being at college with your body. You're like, mm. you know, hey, you know, how do I feel when I eat this particular food? That's what this is. This isn't a lifetime diet for you. This isn't restrict all these foods forever. This is take out all the irritants for a short period of time, Add them back in one by one and see which one is causing problems. So your question is, you know, do I have to suffer? And my answer is no. If you go to our website right now, Ali gives away these, these uh, videos, you know, to teach people how to make plantain tortillas with sweet tart uh, cherry chicken, uh, you know, that's actually 
the most incredible combination you're going to taste. I mean, this wonderful, mildly sweet flavor of a plantain tortilla with this tart, cherry, savory uh, chicken flavor. It's just phenomenal. It'll burst your taste buds wide open, you know, if you can tolerate we're, avocado. We're coming over for dinner tonight <laughs> totally. because that sounds so good. <laughs> I, I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much on the elimination diet most days because I have a lot of reactions. But uh, not not everybody has that. But the turkey soup that I'm eating this morning is phenomenal. It's cauliflower and sweet potato and turkey and whatnot. You know, that's it's a stew more like I should say. But there's there's no starving here. Hello, there's plenty of recipes. You know, we do do a two day detox liquid based diet when you first come in. And those first two days, you know, people are used to consuming liquids. But I'll tell you what, it calms down your gut more than anything else. You know, broth based detox soups with lots of mm. vegetables. Oh my gosh. Add in some fresh vegetable juice, maybe a green smoothie. And then wow, watch what happens to your energy level. Watch what happens to you just feeling fabulous. So uh, I don't I don't think you need to suffer. I think the the most suffering occurs right here. Mm. When you start telling yourself you know what? I should be able to eat chocolate. I should be able to have my cheese. I should be able to have my grilled cheese sandwich. And I'll say, yeah, you should and you can. Go ahead. Do that. I'm not going to force you to do anything. <clears throat> All I'm going to say is there were thousands before you who let go of those things and their symptoms disappeared. So if you want to have your comfort foods, that's cool. If you want to have your symptoms at the same time, that's cool. But if you let go of some of those foods that you think are making you comfortable, your discomfort goes away. All of a sudden, you don't have the joint pain. You don't have the headaches. You don't have the skin problems. You don't have the bowel upset. All of a sudden, you can think clearly. You can act clearly. You can love openly. And I'm serious. You take your life to the next level. You know that. I, I really appreciate you know talking about the mindset and how that is such an important obstacle or you know something that we need to be working with. I want to drill down a little bit further and talk to you about people who eat for emotional reasons. Yes. And how, you know, I'm, I'm just curious about the conversation that happens in the head, you know, when it comes to especially the, the foods that are particularly addicting, like the processed foods or even yes. avocados or chocolates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how do we, how do we help people kind of break through that and also how much of the addiction, kind of the addictive quality, is related to the food reaction? Okay, those are those are there's three different question layers in there. But um, let's get to the most common food addiction reaction first, and let's talk about people not being mad at themselves. Okay, <laughs> because so many people get frustrated. They say, "I really want to do this. I know it's going to be great for me. I've had you know 20 different friends who've done this, and I just can't seem to let go of cheese, or I just can't seem to let go of bread, or I just can't let go of sugar or caffeine, or whatever the case is." And so they just beat themselves up. I mean, we already know the addictive qualities of sugar and caffeine. They're they're over you know the 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 internet and and over the airwaves all the time. So we know about those. But a lot of people don't understand there are opioid-like compounds found in wheat, found in dairy, found in the gluten-based products that can lead someone to actually have physical biochemical addiction to them. So cheese is actually one of the strongest things. I mean, that's why you hear Kim Kardashian and Oprah saying, oh, I tried an elimination diet, but cheese was the hardest to give up. Think about it for a second. This is physiology. Let's talk to your obstetrics here. Let's say, what do you do to calm a newborn baby? When you have a newborn baby and you want it to calm down, what do you recommend the mom does? Breast milk. <laughs> breast milk. Why? Because in feeding breast milk, you pass on these opioid-like compounds that sedate and addict the child. Nature is wise. Nature wants a child to grow up quickly. Nature wants, whether it's a colt or a human baby, they want the infant to breastfeed and grow quickly. So they're not prey to whatever surrounding predators and they can survive in this world. It makes sense, right? Well, how do you make then a sedating, addicting drug? It's super simple. You get rid of a lot of the extra liquid, some of the fats, and you form a block of cheese. Because the casomorphine concentration in cheese is through the roof. So literally, I've had people have shakes. I've had people dream about cheese. They'll call me up and say, I can't do another day without cheese. And I'll be like, oh, you know, that's great. This is a drug speaking. You know, it'd be just like you giving up drugs. So we talk about that drug physical addiction and we offer them Epsom salts baths. We offer them charcoal. We offer them broccoli sprouts. We offer them the actual metabolism support they need for their liver to function and for their mind to stay calm. 
So interestingly enough, in the state of detox, oftentimes it's overexcitatory, right? So they'll get anxious and, and wired. So we just we offer the things that chill people out, which is very, very good for support. The other thing I speak about in the book, Sarah. Wait, don't you tell them to do Qigong? Ah. <laughs> or yoga? That's or, hug, or hug more often? Oh, I love those things. Yeah, I'll send them to you guys for those. Okay. Yeah, well, for the hugs, I mean, I'm happy to give them as well. But yeah, so uh, the other piece, though, Sarah, you know, it, what we were talking about is looking at the quality of thought surrounding a particular food. So, you know, some people, they'll, they'll think about a particular food and not have an idea that that's associated with love time with their mother or father or family, you know. So, for example, every Sundays, right, we'd have these meals as a kid, right, and we'd uh, make this tuna salad that was my favorite, and we'd spread this cheddar cheese over the top. So when I gave up cheese, I kept having these images of my family sitting around this table in Hawaii watching the humpback whales over the cliff that we lived on, you know, and it was just like, wow, these, the, you know, beautiful thoughts come rushing back. And when I think let go of cheese, does that mean I get to let go of that idea, that feeling, you know? And, and it's like, no, it's, it's not about that. This is about me just letting go of my joint pain. But one of the quick lessons that I do is I just say, take your thought and turn it around. It's a piece of Byron Katie work, right? So if somebody says, okay, I have to have chocolate or I can't succeed at this or this is too hard, I just say, turn it around, whatever the thought is. You know what? chocolate may be overrated. Maybe I can be without it for a while. Maybe this isn't that hard. Maybe I can do this. Just quick. Like as soon as I just have people practice that, as soon as the thought comes up, play around. Don't even take yourself seriously. Just play around with the opposite idea. And when you do this consistently, watch what happens. It confuses your mind and you no longer can stick on these ideas of strife and pain and anger and fear and upset. And all of a sudden, all you get is like, Hey, maybe life isn't so bad, you know? Maybe life is kind of fun. You should practice it sometime. It's, it's something I do all the time. Tom, one of the things, um, and, you know, Tom and I have a long history at this point. He was, you know, both of you guys were in my last movie, and Tom came over and uh, really rocked my world in one day when we were putting it in our garden and just started talking about the soil and what needs to go into the soil and how that translates into minerals and microbiome into our bodies. And it was just this, like, really super duper deep um, elaboration into what home gardening actually is. And, and, and in, in a lot of ways, it was just a, a spiritual conversation. I mean, it was <laughs> like, wow, this is powerful and it's deep. Um, and so you're one of my favorite people to talk about the microbiome with. And Sarah and I, you know, we, we, we really dig this. How much of the microbiome gets affected by this elimination diet. There's been so much talk about like, oh, you know, if that happens, just eat acidophilus. And, and we all know how complicated that is. So I'd love for you to kind of connect those dots between the elimination, the inflammation, sure. and the microbiome. Oh, absolutely. So the microbiome shifts within three days time of shifting your diet. So a lot of times when you shift your diet, you will notice gas nausea bloating within the first couple of days, maybe some upset, maybe some head fog, maybe some brain issues and whatnot while you're doing some die off, while you're doing some shifting. And so I love to recommend activated charcoal during that time. I love to recommend that people uh, make sure they're drinking lots of fluid. They're taking Epsom salts baths. They're eating broccoli sprouts because a lot of these dead organisms are perceived as toxic substances. So when you do have a die off, you need to support that detoxification, if you will. So absolutely, there's a massive shift. And we are all about plants. We love people consuming plants. We love animal products as well, but we really understand that the shift in gene expression happens most commonly from plant-based chemicals. So we're recommending a lot of soups. Uh, we're recommending a lot of the raw uh, juices if you have a juicer. If not, we're throwing some vegetables into some smoothies. And we constantly recommend people have broccoli sprouts on their counter. We give a really nice video on how to sprout your, your broccoli sprouts. And wow, just that intervention alone is phenomenal at shifting the microbiome. But then we also add in some herbs. I really encourage people to grow their own herbs. It's something I do in my clinical practice all the time. It's something I'm doing on uh, interviews and podcasts. I say, hey, gang, mint is one of the easiest things to grow and one of the most enjoyable things to add to smoothies. Peppermint, it's so easy. And peppermint, interestingly enough, is phenomenal about interfering with something called quorum sensing or the communication between microbes to form biofilms. So you can actually stop microbes from 
just flourishing in your intestinal tract by the simple eating of herbs. Peppermint oil is phenomenal. Some people do the enteric coated peppermint oil called EPO. But my goodness, I just recommend eating peppermint because it's so delicious. And if you have kids and you're not averse to the raw stevia leaves, what you can do is you can actually wrap peppermint in stevia or vice versa and just roll it up and start chewing on it like a bunny rabbit. And you can make the most delicious peppermint candies. My kids love this. I have a video on this online. And they just freak out. Every time we, we have our stevia growing on our peppermint, you know, you'll catch them on the porch just going. Nah, 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 nah. And really, the peppermint herb contact is phenomenal. And then I take them out in the woods and we wild harvest and we do rosemary and we do or Oregon grape and we do, you know, oregano. So we do a combination of culinary herbs. We do a combination of wilds. And uh, I'll tell you what, that's what every culture used to balance the microbiome for millennia. They used plants. They used bitter alkaloid compounds found in the berberine. They used olive leaf. They used all sorts of holy basil. You name the compounds in the plant now, we're seeing the research shows, hey, they happen to leave you with beneficial microbes and the pathogens die off. So there's no accident for a lot of mm. these foods. So we get into that as well. I love this. Totally love this. So you, you've mentioned broccoli sprouts a couple of times, and I have had the pleasure of talking to you about how to do broccoli sprouts in your kitchen, like do it with your kids. Uh, and yeah. we did this for spring break last year. So I would love for you to just describe how you can do the quick broccoli sprouts in your kitchen. Yeah, check out our video. And, you know, basically you can do it in a mason jar or, you know, just a quart jar. And you can put in two tablespoons of broccoli seeds. You can cover it with water, shake it up a little bit until they sink to the bottom, and then use a sprouting lid. I have stainless steel ones, and I have plastic ones that I've had for years and years. And you turn them upside down. I like the stainless steel. Turn them upside down, drain them out, and then whoop, put them sideways in a dark place in a container like this so they drain. And then the water doesn't sit on the, the seeds because that can cause them to mold. Okay, so they drain out nicely. Then two times a day, just take water, add it back into the jar, swish it around, get all the seeds wet, pour it out again, leave it in a container sideways so it drains out twice a day. Watch what happens. In your neck of the woods, it's probably four or five days, you'll start seeing a nice growth popping out there, you know, and then you just stick them in the window and then they green up. And once they've greened up, then I like to take them in a bowl of water, dump them out in a bowl of water, swish them around a little bit and the little seeds float to the top. And then I'll take, you know, the seeds and drain them off and hold the sprouts. Then I just put them in a Pyrex container. I put them in the fridge, stainless steel container, take them with me on airplanes. You saw I travel with these things. The other way is to put them into a baking dish with some seventh generation non-bleached paper towels. And you take the soaked seeds, drain off the extra water, put them into the paper towel, fold another paper towel on top of it, and then water that. And you wait until the top layer pushes the paper towel up about a half inch. Then I peel back that front paper towel and I keep watering that little garden and it grows as a, as a, a sheet of, uh, of sprouts. And then I can take that and I put that in my to-go container and I take it to work and I take it in traveling or wherever you know, I want to go. And you can just either pick them off or you can snip them off with scissors. So it's like growing your own garden. But now this time of year, you know, it's, it's getting warm outside. So you can actually take the seeds, go spread a little layer in your soil outside or bring the soil into your kitchen in a tray and then put the seeds into that soil cover them lightly, keep them moist, and boom, you can grow them straight in the ground and go out with scissors and clip them. So there's no excuse, really. They're so easy to grow. Love that. And I, I have to say, I went for the paper towel and the 13 by 9 inch pan because that was a little simpler for me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I just want to, I want to call you out here, Tom, because you're quite modest. You've done a TED Talk on broccoli sprouts and you are <laughs> the DNA whisperer. So I just feel like People need to understand there is so much science behind your recommendation of the broccoli sprouts. The science is super deep. And the really neat thing about this is uh, to see how much more is coming out. I mean, I don't know if you saw Zimmerman's uh, trial that came out on autism, but uh, you can actually reduce significantly autistic symptoms by increasing the consumption of uh, broccoli sprouts. So uh, it's phenomenal what the sulforaphane and these compounds can do, whether you're looking at skin cancer, bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Data is fantastic. If you look at air pollution and the excretion of air pollution, they actually went over to China and gave broccoli sprout beverages to people and watched as toxins started flushing out of the system more readily. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. In essence, these substances are the most potent antioxidant detoxification plant-based compounds that we've seen to date. 
they're really quite phenomenal. So to take it lightly to add in broccoli sprouts would be a mistake. This is probably the most mm. potent medicine you can have on your kitchen counter. You can move your, your prescription bottles to the side in priority of, of what's going to change in your body uh, to what's going to change when you start consuming. You know, just a quarter cup is all it takes. Quarter cup a day. If you do quarter cup twice a day, that's great too. Or mix in some broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, whatever you want as well. But my goodness. I mean, yeah, they're really, really potent medicine. Tom, you know what your problem is, is you don't have like a butterfly flying across the screen with a happy family <laughs> holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> we can arrange that. Totally. Yeah. We need, we need yeah. to make a pharma ad because what you're talking about <laughs> kicks the crap out of half the drugs out there, and it's just so yeah. simple. And, and that's that's one thing I want for you to talk to quickly, just because I, I, I just people who haven't felt well in a while don't realize the promise of what they should feel like, right? Like to have a life without the toxins, to have a life without the brain fog and the food sensitivity and all that, and just the the productivity and the output and the and the, you know, the moving away from the depression. Like what do you see? Like what's the what's on the other side of that rainbow when people do this in terms of what they can do in life? Oh. That's the most important thing. You know, people come into my practice and I ask them, why do you want to get better? I say, what's your priority? Why are mm. you here? Because I need to know your motivation before I can connect with you on where you want to go. And you know what most commonly people say? These people who are desperate and they've had chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or they've had terrible, terrible pain or they have skin issues where they can't even go out in public. You know what they say? They say, I want to get back out in society and help people. And all I find I'm doing these days is helping myself. Mm. I, I want to serve again. I want to feel like I'm part of a society and I'm helping other people grow and get better. I want to help my grandkids. I want to help my daughter. I want to help. You know, it's amazing. It's, it's so sweet. You know, the people really have this genuine desire to give and they feel like they can't give because they don't have anything. So what do the, what's the most common thing I hear when somebody comes out of the other end of the elimination diet? I feel 20 years younger and I have a positive attitude. I have a positive attitude. That's, it's weird. They'll say like, you know what? Life is short. I had no idea how many negative thoughts I had, mm. but it felt like because I was in a negative space, that's all I was capable of. And so now that I'm out of that, boom, you know, I'm in a state of positivity and productivity. I've seen people ditch their jobs that don't work and move up to higher levels and positions. I've seen people ditch relationships that haven't been serving them. Once they let go of the toxic symptoms, what they, once they let go of those things that are holding them down, they are actually lifted up and they move forward. So it's totally worth the, the time, the effort. I mean, really, but here's the problem, Pedro, is what you're talking about. There are no commercials out there. There are no conventional doctors who are now considered religious leaders in the United States. I mean, everybody listens to their doctor more than they listen to anybody else. Uh, I would say, you know, if you're concerned about science on the elimination diet, go out and buy the 1940s book called The Elimination Diet. Start diving into Hippocrates' work in, in 790 AD where he starts talking about the elimination diet. Go through all the medical literature from the 1700s on and see all the people who started mentioning the removal of milk or the removal of certain grains or whatnot, whether it was for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. It's phenomenal. I mean, the science is all there. It says this is something that has been practiced before pharmaceuticals, but it's, of course, threatening. The ph you didn't have a choice. You didn't have pharmaceutical a couple hundred years ago. What are you going to do? Everybody knows this, indigenous cultures across the globe. You have too much mucus production, great, eat this herb. Have this root, fruit, or shoot. It'll make you feel better, right? Stop eating this food. It makes you too hot or cold, or it has a, an effect on your kidney or your spleen if you're looking at, at uh, the Eastern philosophies. Everybody knew. Everybody knew certain foods cause certain symptoms. So why are we saying, well, that's unscientific? You know, I don't believe in that gluten thing. And it's like, <laughs> come on, guys. This is just science. It's standard, hard science and it's alternative only because it's not a pharmaceutical but think about that that's not logical this is an alternative this is food this is something you ingest all day long every day why wouldn't you look at that as being the suspect for whether you're feeling fabulous or not 
<laughs> we live in a culture where we take alternatives to food, too. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> Those aren't real foods in the store. Yeah, oh, yeah. my gosh. Okay, Tom, I want to go back to something you, you spoke to at the beginning about FODMAPs. Yeah. And you, I think you also mentioned with the case that you shared with us that uh, when you put that woman on an elimination diet, she still had some gastrointestinal issues that made you pull out the polyols. I feel like FODMAPs is one of those words where, uh, speaking about myself here, but maybe others have this too, their brain just turns off. Like they hear the word FODMAPs and it's just like, you know, they're off to whatever Easy. they're doing tonight. So I, I want you to maybe unpack it a little bit more, like tell us a little bit more about the FODMAPs and how you know that this could be a problem for you, you know, especially for people who go on an elimination diet and it's just not doing the trick. They're not getting rid of the acne or their, their scalp psoriasis is still there. We spell it out in the book. We basically say, if you have these symptoms, then we'd like you to try a low FODMAP version of the elimination diet. So we make it super easy. But I, I, things happen in stories for people. So let me tell you about a gal who comes in in her 70s. Her, her son recommended, I used to see him at the outdoor stores all the time. He was a rock climber. Her son recommended she come in to see me. And she's suffering from this terrible diarrhea. She has these looser stools, these kind of gooey poops is what she'll describe them as. She uh, doesn't feel confident that she can be too far away from a bathroom because she has some issues, right? She's doing six bowel movements a day. And this gal says, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I've talked to my doctor and they're thinking antibiotics. They're thinking all the sorts of stuff. And I've tried so many things over the years. Nothing has touched this. She's been working at this for a decade. So I say, hmm, okay, let's look at your dietary intake, right? And she says, okay, yeah, I, I like to have apple in the morning and apple juice and apple sauce and apple, 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 apple. We live in the great Northwest where we have, you know, I've got nine apple trees, man. We have the best apples on the planet. So I, you know, I feel that one. I, I you know, whatever. But if you are a person who has a FODMAP reaction and you're going to have fructose intolerance like this gal did, right? All you have to do is take out the apples. All you have to do is take out the pears, maybe some cherries, maybe some watermelon. Definitely agave syrup or high fructose corn syrup. Are you kidding? You take those things out. It's that simple. It's that simple. Just those things can make a, a massive difference in somebody. So, you know, just those fruits are the most irritating fruits I see. And then when you get into things like garlic, oh my gosh, garlic can, if garlic causes you a ton of gas, nausea, bloating, or loose stools, or gooey poops as we call them, then oh my gosh, you know, you may have a FODMAP issue. If you eat too many avocados and you have a threshold response, that could be that. So, you know, I just look at the amount of foods you're eating and I want you to pay attention what's bringing your symptoms on. So one of the things we encourage, I don't force you, but we encourage people to journal along your dietary journey, right? That's it. Pay attention to how foods make you feel. So many people are like, hey, I'm going to pay attention to this two-second response I have on my tongue and in my mm. mouth, right? And they're going to go, oh, this is so great. I love this food. Oh, oh, oh. And then, bleh, you know, they just fall apart like within 30 to, uh, minutes to an hour after eating, right? They're moody. They're bloated, whatever the case is. And I'm like, come on. Is it really worth those two seconds? Like, stop for a second. How does the food make you feel? How does it make you feel 30 minutes after you eat? How does it make you feel an hour after you eat, three hours after you eat, three days, three months after you eat it? How does it make you feel? And once you raise that awareness, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know if you're eating certain foods every day and that's causing you bloating. Try eat a different food and see if it goes away. So we give you lists of the high FODMAP, low FODMAP foods. You know, we got to hand out all sorts of stuff. So yeah, we, we really want to support people and Playing around with just one more experiment, you know, if it could save you 10 years of strife and lots of medications and trips to a doctor's office, why wouldn't you cut out apples, pears, and cherries for a little while? You know what I mean? It just makes sense. There's something so empowering, sorry, sorry, there's something so empowering about this because at some point in our history in the last, I don't know, 30, 50 years, we handed our health over to a class of healthcare practitioners that, you know, became kind of the stewards of our health and then we became complete morons when it came to it. Like, you know, when I walk my dogs and they, and I, you know, and I got to scoop that stuff and they got a gooey poop, the first question I ask is what the hell did they eat last night? What'd they get into? Yeah. Yep. And, yep. and yet if you sit down and you've got gooey poop, most people don't even realize they got gooey poop because they flush it and go and they, it just this lack of connection with the, the the biofeedback of your body saying I don't feel well my poop is gooey and all that and and there's something really profound about kind of closing that circuit again and letting 
us become more aware of how we're reacting to that. And I think that's a really uh, powerful promise to the elimination diet, and it, it's, it's deep. You know, that, that, that's a great example. What kind of foods can't you feed to dogs? Um, you know, if they get into, my dogs don't like dairy. My dogs actually don't like grains. Uh, no, let me, get the, let, me, let me put that back. They love the crap, right? They just, you know, I just don't like cleaning up after them. Right. So, you know, my dogs love pretty much anything, but, you know, is this, they don't tolerate it as well. Can you feed a dog chocolate? Um, pff, no. Yeah. If they eat too much, what happens? Um, they, they vomit, they get diarrhea, they get sick. They, they can die. Yeah, they yeah, can there's, die. Yeah, there's chemicals in the chocolates called methylxanthines and that they don't seem to metabolize quite well and they can become toxic. So the reality is the veterinary world knows about elimination diets. Mm -hmm. The veterinary world knows that if you've got a pet who's sick, has kidney problems, has digestive problems, you can shift the diet and their fur will get better, their skin will get better, their teeth will get better. All of a sudden, their disease markers will go down. Vets have been using elimination diets forever. Mm -hmm. They use it all the time. You know, that bones and raw food, the barf diet for dogs, you know, just go on bones and raw food and get away from those grains and get away from, and they'll feel better. So it's like, you know, why aren't humans taking that into consideration? I don't know. I think the only reason why it's not advertised is because it, it doesn't make money. In mm -hmm. fact, it loses money for certain industries that are very privy to advertise. If we didn't have advertising, Pedro, we wouldn't have the idea that it's okay to eat lots of energy drinks and processed foods all the time. We just wouldn't. We wouldn't be okay with having 11 teaspoons of sugar in a carbonated beverage that has caramel coloring that might be cancer causing. And, you know, we just, we wouldn't it, it, unless somebody sold it to us and it looked fizzy and exciting and they're all over the globe drinking this stuff and there's polar bears playing. And so, you know, you're right. We don't, we don't have any advertisement that says, hey, grow your own garden, eat your own food, feel fabulous, you know, because no one's going to make any money off of it. Although we make a different type of currency. That's right. We make with this level of interaction and connection that's phenomenal. There are so many people who are disengaged. All they have time and energy for is to sit in front of the television and curl up in a, I was there. I was there in high school, in college. You know, I would sit on the couch. I would eat these meals and I had no idea why, but I would get so sleepy after meals. I thought, Oh, growing pains, whatever. I'm just supposed to be like that, right? I'm supposed to get moody sometimes. I'm supposed to just have these terrible bursts of bowel problems. It's just, ah, just who knows? You know, a little stomach upset, ah, no big deal. I had no idea you never had to suffer from that. Mm. I had no idea that you can eat a meal and leave feeling energized. I had no idea that joint pain was optional, fatigue was optional, and those bowel things never need to happen. You don't have to have a lot of gas. You don't have to have diarrhea. You don't have to have cramping and bloating. You just don't. So, you know, once you realize that's there, once you go through the elimination diet and you experience a different level, then you're like, ooh, what's next? You know, what, what else is out there? Let's, let's try something else. You know, it's awesome. Yeah. Hey, Tom, we only have you for a couple more minutes, and I, I want to I speak to you something that I've encountered quite a bit with the launch of my new book, and that is um, this point you made about apples, pears, and cherries, and the fructose intolerance. I feel like one of the, one of the myths that we have accepted wholesale is um, that fruit is good for you. Mm. And I, I get a lot of pushback when I talk about the issue of fructose, you know, kind of separate from high fructose corn syrup. And I, I feel like so many people heard the message that they need seven to nine to 11 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And what they do is they eat mostly fruit and not so much of the vegetables. Mm. And they don't realize that, you know, an apple has changed in the past 100 years. The apple that my great grandmother ate had very little fructose in it. And, and apples have been hybridized over the past 100 years to contain a lot more fructose than they used to, you know, sometimes 20 grams, 25 grams. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more because I, I think that that's kind of a tension that will come up for people as they hear about FODMAPs and about this idea of giving up certain fruits. Oh, so yeah, great, great points. The other pieces then we really need to insert into this space the joy of fruit, and let's talk about things you can eat without FODMAPs, 
which would be, you know, lots of berries are phenomenal. Pineapple is brilliant. I mean, one of my favorite smoothies is to use a pineapple coconut base. I'll use coconut water and coconut meat from a fresh organic coconut. And I teach people online how to cut up in coconuts and do the whole thing, you know, and dump it in with some pineapple. And then you can throw in greens, you can throw in berries, you can throw in all sorts of different fun stuff. And, you know, wow, you know, you, you, you don't want to be consuming an entire blender that's just fruit all day long because yes you're right you'll spike your blood sugar you'll have some issues but a little bit of fruit goes a long way so i'll say yes you can still celebrate on fruits don't think that you have to remove fruits and even fodmaps is a threshold disorder meaning you reach a certain threshold of too much fructose and your body doesn't tolerate it so maybe you can tolerate a half of an apple but not a whole apple or maybe you can do a quarter of an avocado or whatever the case may be for the particular food so it's not a death sentence it's a reduction sentence right and I want to mention one more thing, Sarah. This is temporary for a lot of people. FODMAPs is temporary for a lot of people. If they can get to the root of their bacteriologic imbalances, if they can change their diet, if they can replace the nutrients in their intestinal tract, things like zinc, things like glutamine, whatever it is they need to heal, then the intestinal cells themselves become more efficient at secreting these disaccharidase enzymes. They become more efficient at actually supporting an environment where you can grow beneficial bacterium. Did you know that they've done research on certain strains of bacterium producing 186 different enzymes to help you break apart carbohydrates? So if you are missing microbes in your intestinal tract, you may be missing your digestive warehouse to break down some of these substances. So I would say, you know, once you can get the microbes back in balance, you can heal the intestinal tract, FODMAPs can be what's called transitory. It can just disappear. You might not have an issue. You might be able to tolerate more and more and more over time. So with that being said, we have to give the, the light side of this, right? Yeah, for some people, for a period of time, it's probably good to limit the fruits. And I think it's good for everybody to focus on a lot of vegetables. So I, I can't poo-poo fruits. I mean, there are some people who thrive on them, and there are some people who do not. But instead of thinking like when you can't thrive on them, you know, oh, this is terrible, you know, fruits shouldn't be bad for me. You can just think, huh, turn it around, whoop. Hey, this is new. I have to find new alternatives to these fruits. Wow, this could be fun. What else is out there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <clears throat> so it's, it's that fast of a turnaround. But really, vegetables are where it's at. If you want to add increased energy, you want to add anti-inflammatory detoxification, Terry Walls, I just talked to her the other day, she's a friend of mine. She says nine servings of vegetables, nine servings of vegetables. She'll say fruits and vegetables, but she's often in a little bit of berries, but she always emphasizes vegetables. She doesn't say fruits and vegetables, although that's what she's implying. She says vegetables because people will hear fruits and vegetables, mm. right? But they'll put the emphasis on vegetables because she says it. So, uh, yeah, I would say fruit's not bad per se. Our environment is getting to a place of not taking into consideration the tart varieties, the heirloom varieties that have been kind of crossbred crab apple uh, type, wild apple type thing. Uh, yeah, those are kind of going on the wayside to these big sugar bomb balls. And then they're also doused in herbicides and pesticides which then eradicate some of the beneficial microbes that help you digest starches. And so it's just a systemic issue more than it is anything else really. Love that. So I saw a commercial that, that really uh, made an imprint on me a while back, and um, it was uh, Larry the Cable Guy standing in front of some hot dog stand saying, you know, oh, I don't want to, blocking. I don't want to give up my <laughs> lifestyle because I'm gonna, you know, continue to eat like an idiot. But you know, be, then thanks to this drug, whichever one it was, I can keep doing this. And so you're the anti Larry the Cable Guy here trying mm. to tell people how to sensibly approach being healthy and not having to do this interventional nonsense. And, and it's just, you know, the, the propaganda is it's just insane, right? Just don't oh. eat like that and you won't suffer. You don't need the whatever the, the, the fill in the product is if you take care of yourself better. So Tom, uh, we're pretty much out of time. I need you to help us connect people with your book. Everyone needs to read your book. How do they get a hold of it? WholeLifeNutrition.net. WholeLifeNutrition.net. Go to our headpage there. There's an image of the book that says pre-order now. Sign up. 
and you'll get free cookbook from Allie, which is great, a free quick start guide from Allie, which is awesome. And then, you know, you will get notifications from us when we launch programs online and we do stuff. I, I walk people through our elimination diet, you know. I wish I could see everybody in clinical practice, but I can't. So we do these virtual groups where we run them through the elimination diet, and it's been a lot of fun. You know, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, you're so busy. How do you do it? And I'm like, how do I not do it? You know, I just, I love that. I love to hear the stories. I love to see the pictures. I love to bump into people at medical conferences. And, you know, five years ago, they went on the elimination diet. And now they're an alternative medicine practitioner because they went to school to become a nutritionist. And it totally changed their life. You know, it's, it's phenomenal. So wholelifenutrition.net is where you can find that. Thank you, Tom. So delighted to have you with us today. It was just such a pleasure. We yeah. talked about so many different things. I'm going to do the mint and the stevia, and I'm going to go on Amazon and get my organic broccoli seeds again. Do Booyah. some sprouting. Booyah. See? See? You <laughs> did it. You got, you got Sarah moving. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's the way to do it. And I'll tell you, you're going to have a ton of fun with those mint candies. I'll send you the video of my kids. It's just hilarious. Okay. Awesome. Good. Tom, God bless you, man. You are, you are fighting the good fight and you've been doing so for years. So, you know, we're honored to have you back on the show. And uh, man, you, we, I love the fact that you can be a regular because you're, you're one of our favorites. So thank you. Uh, and again, uh, everyone go to wholelifenutrition.net. Uh, get the book, and um, let's talk about how you feel after you start your elimination diet. This is uh, Dr. Pedram Shoja here, Dr. Sarah Gottfried, and the famous Tom Maltair, who we Thanks, love so guys. much. Thank you so much. <laughs> love you guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody.